So the first session we're going to do is a Q&A between myself and George Musenich, whose name I probably pronounced wrong. How was that? Well, you, you, did, it, you did a wonderful job. Thank you. I, I'll, I answer to anything that starts with an M. Yeah. My work here is done. So, um, George is a veteran, I think. Are we okay calling you a veteran of the credit industry? I look terribly young, but I am a veteran. <laughs> so George, I think, is going to tell us about the highs and lows of the credit industry as he's seen it for the last few years, and also about his firm's expansion into the European market, and they set up a Dublin base a couple of years, about a year ago as well. So I guess, I guess first of all, maybe George, if you tell us about the opportunities you guys see in the European credit markets today, and then we can take it from there. Well, I can certainly tell you about the lows. I don't know if I know anything about the highs, but I'm pretty good on the lows. Uh, opportunities in Europe in the credit markets. Uh, well, you know, just to perhaps state the obvious, we are in a world of, you know, it's a theater of the absurd. Uh, you know, the more you borrow, the lower your interest rates are. The, the laws of demand and supply don't, uh, don't apply anymore. Uh, negative interest rates, we've never seen it in the world. So, uh, you, you know, it is a period of, uh, you know, quite unique, quite unique. Uh, so in this, you know, period of, uh, you, you know, such a different world, you, you have to figure out, you can't go on precedence, you've got to try to understand. Uh, first of all, I think we all agree that central banks will continue to be reasonably stimulative or unreasonably stimulative, but they will continue to pursue a stimulative policy. Uh, I think that increasingly you'll have uh, fiscal, uh, a certain fiscal stimulation also gradually worked through the system. Uh, the politics, uh, what they are in, uh, in Europe, will, I think, encourage that. So what we, uh, you, you know, you, you definitely do want to try to, first of all, help out those people who are subject to negative interest rates. I mean, think of it. You're a, you're a 60-year-old pensioner. What do you do? Do you go into venture capital? What do you do with your savings? Sometimes knock that down. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's a drama. So how can you help the, the savers, the, the people who, you know, want to keep, uh, uh, stay flat on a purchasing power basis? Uh, what you want to do is also create an area that gives people comfort because investing in 10-year sovereigns, and I apologize to all the people who are involved in sovereigns here, but, you know, I think what used to be safest is now the most dangerous. You've got enormous amount of duration risk, I think, and buying a 10-year bund, wherever it is today, doesn't seem to be, you know, particularly appealing, at least not to me. It could be a good trade, but certainly not a logical investment. So you've got to seize the opportunities there and come up with programs that limit duration risk and allow people to make a, you know, sort of a decent return. A long answer to a short question, sorry. So if you don't like sovereigns, then I guess that brings you to stuff like um, corporate credits. Nice that you asked, thank you. Because we do corporate credit, by the way. So in the European context, we don't do so much corporate credit. And we had the Capital Markets Union and there was a lot of hope around that. And now with the biggest capital market, London, not being in the Capital Markets Union, that kind of raises certain question marks. How do you see corporate credit and the capital markets, right. the capital well, ecosystem in the yeah. EU evolving? Well, what you have in Europe, of course, is a system which was really bank dominated. I mean, if you look at the United States, uh, you know, 70, 80 percent of it uh, financing was done by the capital markets. In Europe, it was the inverse. It is gradually changing. And the ECB, the, uh, the regulators, the, the, poli the, the political establishment understands that it is vital for the health and the growth of the European, uh, uh, the European market to develop a capital markets, uh, a ca capital markets uh, efficiency, which you know, is going to balance out the uh, increasingly uh, cyclical element of the banking industry, which is getting more and more regulated. So I think it is vital for Europe to develop more of a capital markets presence. Yeah. But is it going to work without the UK in the capital markets union? No, absolutely. Uh, you know, the EU is quite a large, uh, you know, quite a large entity, and uh, it has a lot of diversity. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, I, I think the the UK will continue to be a nexus, be a center of financial, uh, you, you know, strength. But you are, I think, will be developing more and more uh, capital markets and actually banking. Uh, 
strength within the continent. And I think, in, in a way, this Brexit will accelerate the process within the uh, European Union. And by this, so you mean that you could see accelerated capital markets union within the EU27 and activity going on there that would previously have maybe happened in the UK? Well, what you, I think what you will see is the emergence of some very large pan-European banks. There's very little as far as pan-European banks, so I think you will see mergers, acquisition activity more and more in Europe. Uh, and uh, so I think that you will see uh, sort of more powerful banks, more powerful uh, uh, entities in Europe, yeah. So, on a slightly different tack, how do you make credit investing exciting in a world where yields are so low? Well, you know, the credit, you know, you know sort of, we, uh, you know, we're, we don't try to be exciting. If you want to be excitement, you know, you go to venture capital, you do uh, terribly exciting things. We're boring. Uh, That's so not a great line for a conference pitch. It, it's not. So nobody talks to us at cocktail parties. You know, they, uh, they, they, they go to people, you know, give them a hot tip on, you, you know, what Tesla is doing or somebody else like that. So we're boring people. Nobody wants to talk to us. But on the, on the other hand, you, you know, uh, you know, we get excited by uh, compounding interest. You know, that's that's the type of thing. <laughs> so it's like watching a cornflake die. You know? uh, so, but the point is, if we can get consistent returns, you know, regular uh, sort of coupon flows for clients, uh, that to us is exciting. It's boring to most people, but you know, then again. It, it does take uh, some strange people to get excited by that. But that's the goal, is to provide steady stream of income and control risk. We're essentially a risk control business. So is the kind of return people would expect from a kind of this kind of steady stream credit business, kind of a 2 3%, 4%, is that a good annualized yield? Well, you know, in today's world, uh, you know, 2% is exciting. You know, 10 years ago, they would have, uh, you know, thrown you in, in the brig or something in jail, but 2% uh, is exciting these days. Uh, so, you know, what you can do is modulate products, you know, it's always a risk-reward relationship, and whether it's 2% or even, you know, what today, even 1% is exciting. Uh, so we live in a bizarre world. But, uh, you know, you go from 1%, 2% up to 10%, but it's always a modulating the right risk-reward. And is there still much appetite for credit, given the yields are so low? I mean, how do you... Well, you, you know, it's a relative world. So, you, you know, look at, uh, you know, what are your alternatives? Do you want to keep cash Bitcoin. in the bank? You have negative interest rates. Do you want to buy a 10-year bond? Uh, again, negative interest rates. You know, we all love equities, but valuations are somewhat higher. So, you know, basically, you should all invest with us. We have the solutions. No, but seriously, Credit is, I think, an area where you can get uh, decent returns and still control risk. And how do you approach some of the kind of hybrids, the hybrid bonds, or like some of the like credit that converts into equity? Are you guys? Well, that? you you've got to do it with a certain amount of trepidation, and uh, it, it's a delicate area. You, you know, I, I sort of hate a sort of a horse that thinks it's an elephant. I mean, either it's an equity or a bond, and when you try to be so both... So a cocoa you know, bond is basically... Yeah, well, you try to be... It's, it's, it's a cute idea. It's, you know, it has its place in portfolios, but I really do think you've got to be very careful. And again, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a zebra, but it thinks it's a leopard or something like that. So, you know, I sort of liked sort of four-legged creature that knows what it is. But God bless you and Coco, it's nothing negative, but you have to be But you're careful. a zebra leopard, okay. Well, you know, just, you, you got to understand with the creature. So I'm going to ask you about areas now. What area of the world do you think there's the best opportunities in credit on a risk-reward basis? On a risk-reward basis? Uh, well, look, in, you know, talking about yields, obviously, you know, what's interesting you, you look at the same credit, the same triple B credit, and you get a point uh, 100, 150 basis points higher by investing in emerging markets. So the same level of, uh, you, you know, sort of credit rating. So, you know, that is the easy answer. Uh, but, you know, there are different areas within countries. Uh, you know, we've now started going into aviation financing you know, that can give you very nice returns. It's a global industry. It's dollar denominated. A very Irish industry, too. It's a very Irish industry, therefore, obviously. Okay. I mentioned it, exactly. 
Uh, so, you know, there are different areas which are, you know, sort of global, but, uh, you know, you do, do certainly get a pickup in EM. We do hard currency. We're not smart enough to do local currency. Got it. So, do you have any hopes that the world's major central banks are going to become any more helpful to credit in the kind of short to medium term? Well, it, you know, uh, hope springs eternal, uh, but, you know, it is... You know, it, it is challenging for banks because the regulations are getting more and more constraining and it's difficult really to, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, be as expansive, as stimulative as I think they'd like to be, but some have done really quite a, quite a, quite a lovely job. And, you know, I think the future is really a good harmonious relationship between the traditional banking sector and capital markets providers. So I think working in symbiosis will be, I think, very, very productive. And the role of central banks, I mean, do you have any hopes for the Fed raising rates anytime soon? Uh, you, you know, uh, I'm just looking out of time, I, I, I talked to. Don't much. worry, I will definitely warn you. All righty, all righty. Well, you, you know, central banks, I think, everywhere will continue to have a stimulative bias. Uh, you know, I think every central banker in the world has this sort of uh, background nightmare. Am I going to be, you know, uh, Am I going to make the same mistake the United States made in the mid-30s when, you know, the United States came out of the Great Depression and uh, the Fed in the mid-30s and 36, I think it was, uh, stepped on the brake because it was worried about inflation. Uh, interest rates went, uh, I'm sorry, unemployment went from 25% to 14% rapidly. The Fed got worried about, uh, about inflation. They put on the brakes and unemployment went straight up to 19%. So I think every central banker wants to make sure they're not accused of doing the sa same thing and putting on, applying the brakes too early. So I think what you will continue to see is a certain bias to stimulative policy and the hope is that, you know, I, I think the uh, uh, financial policy uh, that you get some stimulus uh, effect in the, uh, in the system through, uh, through, fin uh, through the fiscal system so that you'll have fiscal policy, uh, uh, you know, help out the, uh, the monetary policy and then monetary policy can become a bit more neutral. So over your career, do you think technology has done much to make credit markets more efficient? You know, if you don't mind, and I, I hope there's not anybody from the IMF in the audience, uh, I think it was 2006. You can look it up. You can look it up. I think the IMF stated that the world, uh, the world of finance has become more stable and more predictable and more solid because of credit derivatives and structured products. That did not age well. And of course, what was the reason that uh, everything collapsed were exactly those two things. So, uh, you, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult, it's never easy, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I think they're doing their best, and it's, but it's, uh, you know, it is a challenging, challenging effort. And do you see much improvements coming from, like, technology, AI, like, faster trading platforms? Does that help much? Well, I think trading should be faster than it is. And now it's going at, what, one trillionth of a nanosecond or something like that. Uh, you know, I do worry, I really do worry about, you know, the market is more and more dominated by uh, algo traders, by, uh, you know, fast trading, and where the nanosecond really does count. And, you know, the purpose of a stock exchange, what is the purpose of it? The purpose of it is to finance business and commerce. And, you know, God bless the people who are smart enough to figure out how to they get that one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent on a trade. And it's wonderful. But in the end, you know, we're getting further and further away of the purpose of a stock exchange and, and a capital market that's to raise money. So, uh, you know, it's great in a way. Uh, there is efficiency. But, you know, another thing to sort of worry about, because... As you go away from the basic notions of a stock exchange, what happens, you get more and more short-term thinking. People play trends. And what I worry about, when you start seeing a downward trend, like you saw at the end of 2018, uh, if that magnifies itself, you know, you get a real sharp downturn in the trend followers because there's less and less conviction in the fundamentals. And that could sort of uh, create a uh, snowball effect, which could really be quite painful.
So I gather from that answer that you're not hiring armies of these like quants or these algo traders. So what, what kind of skills are you hiring for? Well, uh, you know, it's people exactly like you who are smart, you know, who get it. Uh, so, uh, you know, look, you try to hire smart people, but, uh, you know, we're certainly not going to be known as the preeminent firm in algo trading, that I can guarantee you. All righty. Um, have we any questions from the audience? We've got about three minutes left, so we'd like to take some questions if we have any. Uh, the audience has not let us down so far on questions, so I'm sure we have at least one or two from Mr. Musinet Chair. Confusion reigns to complete, yes. Have we got any questions? Yes, gentleman in the middle, thank you very much, sir. We'll get you a microphone there. Thanks. Uh, my question is, how do you view leverage in the system today and uh, what trend could it possibly take, you know, the markets going forward? No, it's an excellent question. You're absolutely right to pose it. You know, there's 50 more percent, about, I think, close to 50 percent more debt today than there was in 2007. So it's an enormous problem. And, you know, that's one of the problems you create in having negative interest rates there. It in encourages leverage. So you get more and more leverage in the system. And that is one of the, I think, fundamental concerns that you have to have there's more and more leverage in the system. Absolutely, there's no question about that. Both on the sovereign level, and you have to worry about some of these emerging markets who you know, are dependent on uh, extractive industries who borrowed more and more, and you know, as, these, as these industries go into a cyclical decline, uh, you know, what is gonna happen to these economies? So you, you do have, it as an, uh, it's a problem both in, uh, in, you know, in the corporate market, but also certainly on the sovereign side too. So is the issue of leverage then the one that keeps you awake at night or is there something else? Well, a lot of things, you know, we're paid to worry, that's what, so, you know, we have nightmares all the time. But yes, leverage is absolutely one of the things I think you do have to be, uh, have to be aware of. You know, in today's world, the more leverage, nobody seems to give up, you know, give a darn anymore, but I think you do have to, at some point, you really reach a tipping point where it's going to come back and harm you. Is that Absolutely. going to be in the next year or two? In exactly 14 days and 17 hours, yeah, look, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you, you, nobody can call a market turn, nobody can call a market turn. But the risks are increasing, let's just be aware of that. Valuations are stretched, so you know we just have to be aware that you know we just cannot keep ballooning, ballooning, ballooning with our leverage. All righty. Well, on that happy note, I think we're going to wrap it up with uh, 20 seconds to spare. So I finally got some minutes back for us. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you.